afternoon uh, and welcome to session nine of Art Saturday, a program that is aimed at providing educational material for um, artists, musicians, writers, as well as um, community arts facilitators. Uh, my name is I'm the host of this session and the curator for the program. Last week, we gathered to view um, and discuss new work by uh, artist, philosopher, poet, Dadeli uh, Fibitlad. The recording for that session is available uh, on the Art and Ubuntu Trust YouTube channel. Um, the exhibition and the chat uh, consisted of consisted of uh, uh, Dadeli is proverb and collages. Um, and if you would like to also access previous sessions, we encourage that you go to Atene um, the website, and you will find all that information there, or you can log on to the YouTube channel, uh, where you will see all the sessions from session one with uh, the musician and the late Penny Whistle player, um, uh, that did Jack Lerole, uh, Porta and ceramic artist in Nema Guarela Elizabeth Makahane, and uh, book launch listening to literature towards uh, South African canon, and many, many uh, other sessions, uh, previous sessions. So I'm sorry because there's some people texting about sound and other things. Uh, so I have to be in two places at once. So this week, though, we will begin our session uh, by screening the 28-minute long uh, film on uh, the late um, artist. Uh, and then we will be joined by uh, two of our guests, uh, historian Temi Gosu Boniwe and uh, Ati Mungezere George. I was an art critic um, and theorist based in Johannesburg. Uh, so I will not hold you up any longer, we will come back and chat a little bit um, today of, uh, about the film on Ennis Mangoba. If you're ready, Malik, you can play the film and then come back for a uh, discussion. All right, all right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, and to those that just joined us or just logged in, thank you for choosing to spend this day with us today. I would like to also send out a warm welcome to uh, a dear friend of the Manobas, of uh, Ernest, Sonia, and Wonga, uh, Alain Spillman, who joins us from Paris. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Uh, so this is a part of the section of uh, art sets where we try to unpack some of the content um, that was highlighted on the film. And to do that, we have Tim Ngozi John, uh, Goniwe. Uh, welcome, Tim. Tim Ngozi is an artist and art historian. He has previously lectured at the University of Cape Town, also known as UCT, uh, University of Pakistan, University of Port Hare as well as uh, the Val University of Technology. His, art, um, his artworks have been exhibited locally and internationally, and he has contributed essays to uh, various uh, publications and has curated exhibitions in South Africa, the United States, Venice, and Edinburgh. He holds an MFA from UCT, as well as an MA and PhD in history of art from Cornell University. Goniwe currently lectures art history and visual culture at Rhodes University. The second speaker is Ati Mungazine in Georgia. Georgia is an art critic and theorist based in Johannesburg. He has an MFA from the University of Pakistan in Johannesburg, where he studied the writing of the late South African art critic, Colin Pinchot. His research interests are in modern and contemporary South African art, Ati apartheid cultural movement, art criticism, and critical race theory. Ati is a member of the art collective, The Collective, and of Azania Philosophical Society. 
has written for magazines and journals, and journals including Africana, Yoria, ASAP, Art Forum, Art South Africa, and Nelson Guardian. He was the Andrew W. Medal Fellow at Northwestern University in 2018, where he collaborated with the art historian and the critic Shuri Copeland in a project to devise undergraduate and graduate courses called Appropriation and Discontent. Uh, and then, Ati, welcome to the both of you. Uh, I'm going to start with Ati because uh, Tevi came in late, so he probably needs to catch uh, his breath. So we'll start with the introductions from both speakers, starting with uh, Ati. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can Hi. you hear me? Apparently my voice is not clear. Can yes, you your voice is a bit not clear. Hi, Zubeda. Um, hey, thank you so much uh, for this. Um, you know, it brought so many memories for me. Um, well, well, not really, but because I watched the, doc the documentary often enough to uh, to catch up with so many things that are said in it and other places where NS Mangoba's name is mentioned. Um, I want to thank you guys for inviting me to have this conversation. Um, on this very marvelous artist, a very interesting person, completely understudied. Uh, if not understudied, maybe I'd say someone whose work is, though there's so much about him, enough in comparison to other black artists, um, but whose work has, I think, has been sadly misrepresented at least in terms of his earlier writings, which I have been in, interested in going back to, uh, of course, with my own problems, but, you know, uh, and all of this, I mean, for me, uh, has much to do with the fact that I owe much of my knowledge extensive knowledge and training, rigorous training, I must say, uh, to Art and Ubuntu Trust, and, and specifically to the work of the intellectual superiority and insistence of Bridget Thompson and Abdul Ahmed Said. Uh, I don't know if many people would have survived what I survived in what I would call the trenches, learning under these two people, um, doing workshops across the country, showing this particular video and many other things relating to Ernest Manoba in the most remotest places and also in even the epicenters, but focusing more on uh, more marginalized spaces. And this would be one of those, this film in particular would be one of those things we would use to introduce the work of Ernest Mangoba to people who didn't know them. How I knew Ernest Mangoba, um, I, I knew of him from high school, high school art history, uh, but I guess what I knew of him and our new of, you know, reading things was always just, I guess, really part of the extended nature of Bantu education post-1994. And what I mean by Bantu education post-1994, I mean the kind of art historical training that has sustained itself uh, even after apartheid where Black artists are taught 
the life and work of black artists is taught in, 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 in ways that I've realized now as I'm also becoming an, an adult uh, to be very problematic. So in this training, driving together, going to all these workshops, you know, we'll have very robust conversations. Uh, pleasant, but very difficult, very, very difficult conversations. And going back and thinking about the importance of this, of this film, not only this film, by the way, because you, 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 I'm an art student who is, working with two filmmakers. Uh, and I'm, I'm having, I, I'm, I have the responsibility somehow, I feel the responsibility to defend something. Um, but it, it was a very rigorous, some other day we'll talk about, I'll have to talk about this. Um, but I want to thank both Bridget and Abdul for a very rigorous training that I've never had before anywhere else. And thinking about the film, I've got very little time. Thinking about the film, I'm just going to just speak quite spontaneously. Thinking about the film, I mean, one of the things that one would have to pick up is Ernest Mangoba at home. Just what I, this, I, 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 because I watched the film a lot, um, what I thought I needed to maybe just speak a little bit about today was just the, the question of Enes Mangoba at home. There's a very affirmative sense um, being of Mangoba being at home. But the interesting part is that we'll always have to think about what is Enes Mangoba's home? Where is Enes Mangoba's home? Uh, is it in KZN? where his family comes from, or is it in Tsomo, where his, his family, well, one would think, Mungoba, of course, comes from the Mvengu people who, for the longest time, it, amongst the Kosa since 1818, uh, were regarded as people who are homeless, people without a home, despite the fact that they were given a home by Inza and all of that. And, and the fact that I'm a Mvengu, we're also, Mvengu means, unlike uh, most people would assume that Mvengu means a tribe, but it, it basically means a refugee. So the question of home is quite interesting for, for, for Mangoba, at not only at a level of placement, geographical placement, um, it means, a lot in a, a, a lot of levels. It, it's, a, it's an interesting question for intertribal war uh, to think about home in the context of Invecane or, or uh, Shaka's wars, as other people will call it, to think about home in terms of Mangoba being a Mvengu Mbo kid who grows up in the mine dumps in Johannesburg, feeling slightly displaced in, you know, and also Mangoba then going to Paris and perpetually being, you know, uh, displaced, going into in the internment camp in the, in the 40s, in the 1940s, early 1940s. Uh, so the very, the very question of home for Ernest uh, is a very interesting question. But also one could talk about home with regards to Ernest Van Gogh in, in art historically, in terms of art. And, and I, most of my research recently has, on Ernest Van Gogh has been about the fact that, in fact, it's inspired by something I think he had said to Bridget in an, in an earlier uh, interview when he said, um, what is that expression? My people are the people of the world. Well, I mean, in contemporary dialogue, on, sorry, in contemporary discourse, people of the world, you know, might seem very naive in the sense in which there's a re particular returns to home 
in very colonial ways, whether through nationalism and all these other things, or national borders and all of that. Um, but because of his, his ancestral displacement, home is always something that is fugitive, fleeting, uh, and never geographical. And even when he speaks about home in terms of art materials, he says art materials, he says in the documentary, uh, uh, the materials are secondary to me. So home is it's never really a specific place. It's, and I, I, even when I say, even when he says, I think home is the, is my is my people are the people of the world, which is actually strangely something that Dumile had said as well in the 1970s and 80s. My my people are the people of the world. He doesn't mean that Ernest Mangoba was less critical of Western chauvinism uh, and certain particular trends in Western epistemological discourses, Western ep epistemological structures. Uh, say, say for example how most art historical practitioners would put Ernest Magnoba's work as more post-1948, 1948, 1938, when he left. The first Ernest Magnoba art historians would like to say begins when he lands in Paris with the painting composition. So they give Magnoba a particular home in relation to Europe, creating this kind of clash between the exile Mangoba and the uh, uh, sort of pre-exile and exile. This attempt to almost always create a home for Mangoba, and yet he had managed to escape this imprisonment, internment, if you like, of, of, of him. Uh, or even one would talk about his most famous quotes around abstraction and figuration. Uh, people say Ernest Mangoba is an abstract artist. And he says, I'm not an abstract artist. I'm not a social realist artist. I am not, you know what I'm saying? So the question of home for me, which the documentary tries to bring about in a very complicated, interesting way, um, is, is what I, I and, and just in a little bit that I want to bring. I mean, I, 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 I think it's actually one of the most interesting aspects of Ernest Mangoba's work that we can never really home it in a particular place, but not even in the way that someone like Rashid Arayin, Olo Kwibi and others, have tried to home it in a particular way that, that it's so global that it is, we cannot reduce it to Africa. The primary place of Mangoba's point, what the, what the decolonialists would call, uh, um, I think it's called the point of enunciation, uh, whatever. Like the, the, the place from which he speaks is particularly from the African continent. And it is precisely because of this uh, position of enunciation as an African that he left in 1938 to be part of the European debates on Africa, um, to assert even uh, an African position that was going on in 1920s, 1930s in Europe. So I, I just want to give those kind of preliminary remarks around the question of home, whether it is home in a personal sense or home in an aesthetic sense or home in a, in a, in a, in a larger political sense. I mean, another thing that we forget, art historians as well have tried to, in this insistence of trying to place Mangoba in a home, when Noba talks about something called, I think it's called the marvelous generation. And art historians have always tried to pin Mangoba amongst artists. And this is the same thing, strangely, that happens with artists like Dumil Lefeni, that, that these artists, because they're artists, they have to be friends with artists. They have to be 
amongst a generation of artists. Where it, his, his, his circle of friends, his generation, the so-called marvelous generation that he talks about in 1996 in that speech, the net bank speech, nothing to do with artists most of the time. It has to do with Ibi Tabata, Jane Gould, uh, Eddie Rue, that generation of the, 40s, of the 30s. That was the marvelous generation. Of course, the question of the marvelous, ironically for Ernest Magnova, the person who was anti-negritude, also comes back to Césaire and Suzanne Césaire, who talked about the fabulous or the marvelous generation of the 1940s negritude intellectuals. For, for him, the 1930s was the home. It was not in the art world. It's larger than the art world. So the question of home is, is something that one can play with, think about. Well, how to home Ernest Magnolia? How to home a fugitive, a refugee that not only refuses to be home because they have never been home before, but they constantly in their own practice push boundaries of whatever that we think home is. It's not the Eastern Cape, it's not KZN, it's not South Africa, because South Africa had rejected him when he wanted to come back after 1945, all of those things. So, so, and it's not even Paris, despite him saying that I was so happy in Paris. Oh, Paris was this, was this, was this. Paris had actually treated him like shit, sorry to say it, but in fact, Europe, when he arrives in London, the first thing that he encounters was racism. And throughout his life, in the Cobra movement, it's never been whole but has always been an artist that strives in very particular ways of a, a much more egalitarian notion of form. I, I don't know whether this has to do with his Marxism or his black nationalist positions, but it's precisely again, even in this, in the, at the, this ideological level, these tensions that come up where we cannot really locate where Mangoba is, but nevertheless, we know what he says we know what he stands for, whether we're critical of that as I am, but we know that this is the kind of artist who Jabulon Debele would, in his, in his ba basic articulation, according to Jabulon Debele in his expression, talking about soul plighty, you know, he calls it something quite profound. He says, tactical humility, tactical humility, that's the word. So, so how he expresses his sense of home might destabilize certain people who, who, who are so fixed to particular forms of, of home. I'm Kosa and Vengu, blah, 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 blah. What I'm saying is that one of the reasons that Enes Magnova's sense of home is difficult to trace might have to do as the documentary says, with the fact that he'd never been at home. And therefore the fact that home never was the place, home is, as he says, the world and, and the world not in the Western sense of the world of universalism, of perspective, of imperialism, of chauvinism and all of those things. Home is this kind of, opening up egalitarian practices of home. Maybe one would say, you know, this is Enes Magnova articulating already from the 1920s, a position of, well, people say call it decolonization, whatever, but the sense of home that is much more open, anti-colonial, decolonial, beyond colonial. Anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you, Ati. Uh, thank you, Ati. Um, we will have Tembi up next, but I would also like to remind everybody that uh, if you have any questions or if you'd like to make a comment, uh, you can just wait a little bit until Tembi Ngosi does his introduction, and then you can use uh, the ask a question. Um, uh, button or text on the chat uh, also 
if you have anything or comments to say. Next up, uh, Tim Ngosi Koniwe. Hello. Am I on? Hello, you are on. You sound can good. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Thank you, Zippo, for the great, uh, for the introduction and uh, greetings to everyone uh, who have attended this session. And I want to also appreciate Abdul and Bridget and the team. And my, if I to give two cents, I'm going to give a cent, right? So that we can have time for a conversation because it's already almost three. There's so much that the video provides uh, and also asks us to think about. And RT have looked at the question of home and what in his uh, concluding remark, uh, brought, you know, it's a question of perspective, which I'd like to talk about here. But I want to talk about perspective specifically in regard to my Nova's comment in the video we just watched. And I want to do that by way of a short uh, kind of exposition so that I can control my thoughts somewhat, right? <clears throat> uh, in the film we hear Manoba telling us about his use of line, which is consciously free from the problem of the perspective so he could visually arrive at his intended point of expression. The rationale for doing so is that for him, at a certain moment, one wants to have the emotional experience intuitively expressed in a work of art because the profit of doing so rests on the knowledge that once the image begins to speak to the artist, the communicated or intended message should be evidently present. It's just a way of, uh, of paraphrasing him, but also of saying, you know, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, this is my preoccupation uh, just for this uh, few minutes I have. And this preoccupation has to do with the expressive properties of Magnova's line, a line whose quality is most certain unique in its expressive form, unmistaken detailing of Manoba's visual signature. For those <clears throat> who have carefully looked at Manoba's use of the line would have noticed its economic utility, but yet substantive enough in its loaded signification, not to mention its varying expressions, registers and dynamics, all effective on dispensing and chanting sensibilities, probing insights or mapping out design patterns. In some instances, it is playful, rhythmic, and even childlike. There are also moments when the line is just there for the sake of itself, by which I mean it represents nothing other than being a functional line in matters of composition. And of course, you've seen this in some of his work, if not many or most of his work. I could indulge further sharing my observation of this aesthetic of my novel's line, but this is not my preoccupation in response to the film. As I said earlier, my preoccupation is rather a probing fascination of my novel's conscious disregard of not only the problem of the perspective, but also the perspective itself. I found this disregard profound and more so revealing and inviting if we are to pursue an inquiry into Manoba's philosophical meditation on one of the greatest achievements in the history of European art, but an achievement that at some point in European history became a dilemma, which radical modernist artists had to question, despise and discard in their, research, in their search for other aesthetic forms of engaging the world in and through visual representation. So in a word, Manova's conscious undertaking articulates what has been the most burdensome convention in the history of visual art making in both Europe and European colonies. It is a convention that for the avant-garde deserved to be destroyed, if not rendered obsolete, in the search for liberated modes of creative expression that demonstrated not only a novel sense, but also the reflective awareness of being a modern subject. Here I'm thinking of subjectivity, agents, interiority, which are the preoccupation of many modernist artists. Thus the pressing project of the avant-garde necessitated experimentation, discoveries, and inventions that would free themselves 
free their imagination from the constraint of traditional art, conventional aesthetics, and inadequate forms of engaging a world undergoing transformation, a world subjected to conditions of modernity and technologies of modernization. Mangal was part of this avant-garde. Although it is important to underscore that his modern consciousness was not limited to the precepts of European modernism. His modern consciousness was complex defined by his own African tradition that was simultaneously wrestling with colonial modernity and its own local organic demands of being a human in a world on the move a move that preceded colonial contact and colonial intervention. I'm referring to the black world whose contact with Europe compounded its cosmological transformation, transformation, which was then compelled by internal and external forces in South Africa and elsewhere in the colonies. The point I wish to register here is that the problems of perspective were not of my mother's inheritance, nor an African heritage knowing the historical fact that indigenous creative and cultural production have neither exhibited nor projected any fuss on the question of visual representation within which the perspective is a matter of illusion, a false configuration of the world projected in a reductive and hegemonic two-dimensional surface or form. Visual representation by the same people of Egyptian, for example, are some of the evidence of the point I'm arguing here. The question is then, why would Mangoba be bothered with or inherited, inherent, inherit the problem of European perspective when he left South Africa for Europe with a clear vision? For not only he had a vision to participate in the search for a new approach of art and to, to be part of the modernization movement, but also to know more about the African contribution to the development of the modernizing world over. Such visionary possibilities were prescribed for him as a black man in colonial South Africa. Thus, his exile or relocation to Europe. In summary, my point is that my noble in the film philosophically articulated conscious critique and refusal to be burdened, refusal of the burdening and circumscribing convention, which in fact is an imposed deception about the way the world is visually. The perspective in visual art is a deception. I want to repeat that and emphasize it, which is authoritatively dogmatic and instrument, an instrument serving a centric disavowal of various and peculiar ways of not only looking and seeing, but also experiencing the world differently or otherwise. Mindful and polite, and politely sub, 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 subversive of the such problematic, Manoba opts to effect an intuitive mode of looking, seeing and experiencing the world through the art of image making. He's very clear that the mode of intuitive expression should not be insisted upon, which implies a creative modality of not forcing metals by subjecting the creative process to prescribed if not expected outcome, an outcome that is, is filtered through the restraints of reason or rationality. Furthermore, Manoba's mode of intuitive expression is a refusal to demand an anticipated, an anticipated consequential effect of the image. Instead, he intimates a creative process that allows for free form of the line work to take its time in dispensing shapes expressing feelings, suggesting thoughts, all of which become the content communicated through form. I should note that intuition or rather instinct to say, to stay with my mother's word is not the opposite of reason or a marginal sense of rationality. It is a, vi is a vital sense, which is both constitutive of reason or rationality and possesses its own capacity, especially the potential for imaginative release for freeing thinking from the stranglehold of rationality or the faculty of reason. Thus is characterization as a perceptive sense, one charged with emotions, and thus is potency for, the, uh, for, uh, for sending the creative mind to the realms of the unknowable or the mysterious or the abstract where imagination is king 
a sovereign where imagination is plenty. It is in this realm of imagination uh, that Mangoba has invested his creative drive and, and aesthetic procedure. A realm in which he wants to be at home without being in Europe or anywhere else. Of course, to be at home whereby he has not to deal with the destructive problems of the world over. Not to stay ignorant of those problems, but he needs that space in order to invent new worlds. To cite my number's own words as a way of just reminding us, because I find that statement more powerful. Let me read it word to word. I use the line without the problem of the perspective in order to come directly to the point of my expression. Because at a certain moment, one wants to have the emotional experience instinctively expressed and not insisted upon. And once the image begins to speak to you, then the image is there. Those are Mangoba's words. What Mangoba advances here, as I try to frame it as a mode of instinctive expression, is also explained when he talks about his work more thought, which he defines as almost Freudian, because for him, it allows his subconscious to rise up in his awareness of the moment. He goes on to say, the soul that I experience will feel the contradictions and misunderstanding that are present in our daily experience. And so I take all my pencils and my practical instruments, my colors, in painting, we have the different colors of the rainbow as it is, and I select from that and that I put them together and they form a language. It is this creative language I'm after and I'm interested in trying to think about and also with my mother's words. One point to make in conclusion is my mother's notion of almost Freudian work my thought. I'll come back to this word almost. For now, let me take the invocation of the Freudian subconscious, which Mangoba explained. And also I've tried to labor, you know, in explaining it as the potential quality and profit of instinct in the creative process of image making, which I phrased, you know, in a number of ways. But for now, let me just stick with what I want to conclude with. That is to say, Mangoba's work method articulated his ability to submit his creative mind into the wealthy, though subjective realm of not only thinking, but also feeling, not only looking, but also sensing. We can go on and on. And remember, these are the properties that tends to be either distangled. So in other words, what I'm trying to think about with Mangoba is that for me, it is this language perhaps we need to begin to, 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 to discourse, you know, because it is there that Manoba's contribution also lies. Equally, it lies in other areas with uh, art as articulated. But also I want to note another thing here with this notion of almost Freudian, because Manoba has a very particular way of using language. When he says almost Freudian, that word almost, implies a number of things, but let's take two. It means it is exactly, but not, it is near, but not. So that, but not only arrests, but it shows my mother's consciousness that he's not only reliable on Freud in terms of his thinking. There's also something other than and more than Freud. And that thing is what keeps coming in the video, the gift, of his inheritance, the tradition that has informed his thoughts to the extent that that gift and that heritage, <clears throat> Mangoba talks about in a very poetic way when he talks about death. Death is not an end. Death is something that is continuous and death is something that we need to own and in fact work with. And in the world of the dead that we haven't been literally, but we can arrive as we have arrived metaphorically. So what now we are talking about is this world of imagination, how to enter that world of imagination through image making. It's to develop a language. And that's why Manoba says his vision when he refused to do those uh, commissioned uh, 
so-called dolls, uh, <clears throat> the cows, the cure work. He knows his vision because the vision he wanted to be part of is to create a language because at that time, he realized the world was not only stifled because of colonialism in South Africa, as if he was censoring the coming of another regime that was going to thicken, thicken the colonial project, which is apartheid. So to speak, he wanted a language to decipher the world, to provide different worlds. And it is this world that we see in his art. Hence, it's not surprised that once he was in Europe, he was able to create those images that he was even somewhat penalized for being made invisible. Because as he himself have said in other sites that it was unthinkable, Europeans could not perceive a black man of his <clears throat> sense to produce those so-called avant-garde work. So in other words, my kind of call and interest is in Manoba's language. It is that contribution I'm interested in, you know, just as a contribution to this. Of course, there's more, we can speak more and more and more. That said, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Tim. We, we uh, will most probably get back to you. <clears throat> if there's anyone with questions, uh, we'll give them a moment uh, very soon. Um, Ati. I have one. I have one question, or maybe it's a comment, right? Because uh, earlier on you spoke about uh, how uh, artists or how Mangoba uh, was misrepresented in the, these earlier years, and you also speak on how uh, other black artists continue to be misrepresented. There's something Abdul Kadir uh, once uh, said. He said that uh, uh, black artists, specifically, was talking about South African black artists are moderated and curated by white people. And that is probably one uh, reason why this misrepresentation is still occurring. Would you agree with that or, or would I you say I, I didn't hear, would I agree with what exactly? I was saying earlier on uh, in your introduction, you spoke of uh, Enes Mangoba being misrepresented in his uh, earlier work. Can you hear me? Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to give an example of that, but I also wanted to uh, to to say that uh, in some one conversation with Abu Kadir, or it's something that he likes to say usually, is that uh, uh, black artists and most especially South African uh, black artists uh, seem to enjoy being moderated or curated by a uh, white curator. And would you say that that is, you know, a contribution into this misrepresentation? Come to the game, guys. Can the person who's at the beauty. check the rank right? just to you? That's Can we mute? That's really present. Oh, that was Malik. Did you get that? Yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of. So come on, respond. Would you say that this uh, continue, I mean, this uh, uh, contributes to the misrepresentation of black artists? Well, I mean, there's, there are particular ways in which I think I have been interested in in Ernest Mangova's work. A large bunch of the people who talk about Ernest Mangova's work obviously speak of the post 40, 30, 19, post -ex the exile work. Tim Gossi, a typical example now, was speaking of Ernest Mangova in relation to his more sculptural work. There's a certain sense of silence, silent scandalization of Mangoba's pre-exile work. And then if you sit with the pre-exile work a little bit, you get to see a sense of how, because that kind of work doesn't have the kind of, the more, um, it doesn't have the language of flirtation, language of flirtation 
that you would find with the avant-garde, the expressive works, the abstract, and all of those kinds. Of, so it's a kind of work that has been relegated to the margins. Even when, for example, people want to defend African modernism, that particular work, which is the work from um, 1929 to 1937, 1938, is, according to most writers, works of Mangoba ventriloquizing white tutelage, which means he's the spokesperson of European classical art. Of course, he responds to this in a number of ways, but particularly in his 2000 and, and two. Um, but if you go back to how people speak about that work, how in particular white historians, white art historians speak about that work, they speak about it as if Enes Manoba enters the field of practice as this kind of blank space, blank canvas, who is then uh, filled with knowledge by his sister Pauline or by a number of other uh, lip sheets and all these other people. So the, the misrepresentation are not only at the level of when knowledge begins to take place, how knowledge becomes, or what we see as knowledge uh, begins to set uh, or becomes visible. It is also at the level of how historians have basically, as Tim Gossi include just towards his conclusive remarks, completely undermined how black people uh, have used not only colonial modernity, but their own uh, traditional practices, traditional ideas to maneuver the space of colonization and colonial culture. So, but all of that work, it seems for most historians, doesn't really matter up until Enes Mangoba is either in Europe or, or when he's in South Africa, it seems as if the work that, 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 the work that we can see, the work that we can see in most of Enes Mangoba's sculptures is just simply the, 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 the knowledge passed down by the missionaries. And, and you can see this literally across most art historians who write about, I don't want to name names, but well, fuck it. I mean, Elizabeth Rankin, Lisa van der Broek, uh, and you know, um, uh, Elizabeth Morton and all of these people um, who write about, or, or Rashid Arayin and all of them who write about Mangoba in this particular way as this kind of empty canvas, tabula rasa, who then gets to be, who, who encounters knowledge only when he encounters white people. Now, the interesting thing is not the same when it comes to his white tutors. Take, for example, two, one scenario, one scenario, let me make one scenario. And as Mangoba makes, persistent point that his mother who was like a nurse or something uh, taught him how to sculpt, taught him poetry, taught all these things. You never hear except for Elsa Myers, this thing being mentioned. There's a new book now called Black Renaissance. I don't know if you've seen this book by a young historian called Joshua Cohen. Completely forgets this thing as well in the typical trend of white art historians. So, so the fact that Mangoba's mother and his uncle and many other people, or even when he's at the university level, Mangoba's possible encounters 
with the Gaviat movement, which was actually quite, which was quite visible in the Petersburg area, as we come to know later. In fact, not even much later, in the early 30s with Peter, Peter Abrams through, through, through the work of uh, how Peter Abrams uh, speaks about his relationship with H.I.E. Long. But there was an, an, a, 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 a serious presence of the Gaviat movement in the 19, but none of that is present. Now, suspend this for a moment. Talk about his tutors. None of his tutors, supposedly, according to, uh, what's his name, this guy, Professor from Rose, Jeff Guy, who did the prophetic nun, and uh, Elizabeth Morton, not Elizabeth Morton, Elizabeth Jenkins, all of these people. So uh, none of these people actually had any knowledge of art, didn't practice art. Uh, in fact, Sister Pauline, quite interestingly, it, it's assumed that she could have been a, an art, a, um, a, a teacher based on the fact that she had learned sculpture from, his, from her father some, some 30 years ago, before coming to, to, to Grace Jew, where Ernest Monobo was a student. So, so all these double standards that have been maintained at the level of representation of Ennis Mongoba's intellectual power, you can directly see. But there's also the part that I mentioned about the, 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 the fact that art historians, cultural historians as well, have provided the kind of narrative that artists like Mongoba, not only him, strangely enough, Artists like Job Kekana, who was exactly in the same institution as Ernest Manov. He himself was not necessarily taught by these people. He was self-taught. He came to Grace Jew with exactly the same tools that all other black students tend to come to white institutions. Um, so he doesn't come as a kind of empty-handed character or anything like that. So the, the misrepresentation ends up then creating this cleavage between the pre-exile and the post-exile. So the analysis that we always think is Mangoba's exile, which he himself rejects, which is pre predominantly the, this, the split between figuration and post-figuration, or rather uh, abstraction. That there is this distinction, very particular distinction uh, between the real and the abstract. So I'm saying, you, but you can see this problematic across the board, across the board, and it's very particular to the pre-exile work. And, and that has to do, I, would, I mean, if I would, I'm allowed to give another two minutes, it has to do in particular with a, a certain kind of interesting wokeness, interesting wokeness to use contemporary terms in art history. Because South African art history was always not a South African art history. It was always a, a colonial art history which has its ties in Europe. So it always picked up the terms of what good and bad was, which means the terms of, of taste, of judgment, based on what Europe was doing. Whether Manova was, uh, you know, I mean, his judgment of his good and bad was judged whether he was close to the missionaries, a la, uh, uh, Tabata or close to the avant-garde a la Lip Lipschitz. And this continues up until today. When people speak about Ernest Mangoba's work, they're not speaking about pre-exile work. The second speaker who spoke about Ernest Mangoba wasn't speaking about Mangoba's pre-exile work. They, everyone takes as a given that Ernest Mangoba's work is the post-40s work. This, which I find very interesting and strange. Yeah. Thanks, Ati. Zube, uh, Zubeda, I see you. You have your hand up. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. 
You're still muted, Zubeda. I can't see myself. You, you're fine now. You, you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm so delighted to listen to both Ati and Tim and Corsi. And I have no doubt in five or 10 years time, we won't be having this conversation because we are freeing our imagination to create a narrative that we're comfortable with. We are going to, all of us together, we need to create a narrative uh, about Ernest's uh, work that suits us and that we're happy with and that we keep on repeating. We're not going to be in defensive mode anymore. I was very privileged, um, uh, I'm not quite sure how many years ago, if it was uh, 12, 15 or more years ago, to meet Ernest and to spend time with him and to have him at my home and also to um, take him around Cape Town, took him to Chapman's Peak, Out Bay, showed him around, um, and he and Wonga. And I've never, I didn't spend, he wasn't here for a long time, but I've never ever forgotten how absolutely delighted I was to be with somebody who understood or believed strongly in a common humanity, you know, believed strongly in, you know, being part of everything. And yet at the same time affirming you know, the, the local. So we're part of, we, we, we're not only one thing, we are many things together. And this is what he expressed uh, in what he was saying all the time, that we, 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 we are all these different things together. And you know, apartheid was put there to put us into little pockets and make our lives very, very small. And we have to use our imagination and our artistic creativity to show how we are part of something very big. We are part of a whole of, and I think that's just what Ernest understood, Ernest was trying to say, that we are part of an entire humanity, and that's what he is part of, the entire humanity. And the African sensibility of Ubuntu is brought to the center of that. Um, consciousness. So I, I have a hope that that we will dedicate ourselves to freeing our imagination and to move away from being in the defensive mode um, and to start preparing for a future that that the story will flow from our tongues so naturally on our own terms, not in the reaction to anybody, on our own terms. And if we have so many difficulties with, or we, we resent, and rightly so, that uh, we get curated by, by people who don't understand our work, I have no doubt that we are going to be curated by people who understand our work if I listen to Ati and if I listen to Temin Kosi. The missing element is the business knowledge, the knowledge of how to do this for to be self-sustaining. But that's a discussion for another time. I just want to finally congratulate Bridget uh, and Abdul Kader, but Bridget in particular, because that form, every time I see it, you know, it touches me very, very deeply. And uh, I'm going to make an effort, Bridget, to see how this form can be gotten to as many teachers, both arts and, um, and other teachers um, into the next year. That's my commitment to you. So fantastic, fantastic session again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zubeda, for your comment and contribution. We have Bongiwe Sheki, so uh, thereafter we will take a comment from Bridget. Hello, Bongiwe. Hi, this is I actually put my hand down, but anyway. Um, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Oh, <laughs> I don't really have a question to say, I think. But then um, 
I just love how Archie was um, expressing himself when he was referring to the to the film itself and also talking about art historians. So I'm a sort of an art historian I write. So I loved how he spoke about the notion of, of home, how we keep on trying to place Mangoba in a home, we're trying to locate him. And I also liked how he was referring to us, to art historians in the manner which they write. They always try to put the people that we, like your Dumi Femi, your Gladys Mkuzalu, your Mangoba, we're trying to, um, to group them in terms of they belong to this history of school or this art history of school. They belong to exp expressionism. They belong to German expression in terms and things like that. So I remember writing about Gulalu and I was asking a question of why is it so important that we put him in that group of scholars or art scholars to say that she belonged to this particular group of German expression. But what my question or what my point will be, what existed prior to that? Because I think that's what Ati was saying. He was saying that what happened or what was happening before Mangoba went to Paris, what, what kind of art was he producing? What was it called? I'm actually quite um, interested to know why, do, why are we forced or why do we always have to allocate them next to Europe-centric art um, schools and not say that they were just African or they were South African artists and this is the kind of work that they did. And also how um, Art was referring to, to Elsa Miles talking about who taught uh, Mangoma to, to actually go into this path of art, which is the same as Gladys. Gladys was taught by her grandmother so by the time she was in Cape Town, she already knew how to do murals. Is something that she was already doing in Eastern Cape. So I think those are just the thought that I wanted to add there and just to say, I actually really enjoy this. And um, yeah, that's it, thank you. Thanks, Bongi. We will go to Bridget. Uh... If I would like to respond to Bongiwe's uh, comment, uh, you can do I'm that fine. after. Uh, okay, after Bridget, can we go to you? Oops. Hello, everybody, and thank you for all the very nice things that have been said. Um, but I have to say that this is a journey that we've we've been going on as a society together. And it's interesting now looking at the film so many years later, it was, you know, it's very rare when you make a documentary film that the, the drama that happens in front of you tells such a rich story. And so um, the, the, the story was easy to tell on film. And it was a pivotal moment in Ernest Mangoba's life. There was a movement, there was, there was a shift. He came back to South Africa after 56 years. It was really a, a great experience to, to, to be able to record that. But I suppose what I'm, I'm thinking about now, well, what is the significance of that pivotal moment for us of reconnecting with Ernest Mangoba? And I want to refer to what Ati was saying. I'm sorry, Ati, I didn't realize we were so strict with you, but well, we traveled the country together, showing this film, showing posters about, about the work and the ideas. And in the process, we, we worked with teachers and artists and, and, and learners in schools. And they said to us, often they cried when they saw the film, as I must admit, I sometimes still do when I see Ernest at the airport with his sisters. But they said, we want to know about other pioneers. And so we set out on the project, which has actually led to Artsat. And we did a whole lot of other short films, which some of you have watched as part of the Artsat program. And the interesting thing is that the, the more you try to draw the links, and, and, and Bruce is incredibly helpful in this, in, in his, his knowledge, his deep knowledge of some of the African values within our society, which he articulates so beautifully, um, that you find in Mangoba's thinking, you'll find a resonance in Mazizi Kuneni's thinking. And in Tembe Nkosi's explication of Ernest Mangoba's 
intuition and the question of the feeling, you find Lefifi Cladi speaking about how important it is for the senses, that in order that, that art needs to reawaken the senses, that children need to um, understand taste, touch, smell. And, and where does this all take us? It takes us back to African values. And responding to, to, to Bongiwe, I think it's so beautiful the work you did on Gladys and Godlandlu because I saw, I recognized in your method, the method that I used, because I'm not a trained art historian, but when I responded to, to Ernest's work, I tried to listen very carefully to what he said and to the things that had influenced him and responding as well to Ati's comment about the, the, the decade or so before he went to Europe and the work that he produced in that time. And, and I hope that Alain will speak a little bit later as well, but Alain, you know, anybody who spoke to Ernest, he said repeatedly, he, he paid tribute to his mother, who was a potter. He paid tribute to the Shangan mine workers who gave him his name, Gongonyane. He paid tribute to the Chinese mine workers who gave him a ceramic cup. He paid tribute to what he learned from Charlie Chaplin's films. He constantly affirmed the importance of Africa in shaping his values. He, he used to say, why is the Africa African religion, a religion of the unknown. And he's talking about that ancestral heritage, which Tim Minkosi was getting close to talking about um, um, towards the end of his uh, towards the end of his his input. So I think that so so through all this work, through engaging other artists, other um, writers, musicians, intellectuals, we've come to realize, we've come to understand through our work in the Art and Ubuntu Trust that there's this whole body of knowledge. And it's, it's a, a body of knowledge, it's about the body of values, it's a body of spirituality, which is so rich in our country and across the continent. And it has resonances right across the continent. And there, I'd just like to put a little side question to Ati that maybe the notion of Ubuntu is home for, for Ernest Van Lover. But just coming back to that, so I came across this really interesting art historian, um, um, Evelyn Nicodemus. And she writes about the two systems of art in Africa. And this was like a eureka moment for me. She speaks about the indigenous system and of course the Western system that was introduced through colonialism. So of course, Gladys and Goodlandlu learned painting from somebody. Um, if you hear, if you read the, the story of George Pemba, his brother used to paint with ash on the wall, must have been a family of artists. I mean. The blob of shells, which were discovered, which are, you know, are 70,000 years old and discovered here in a cave in the Western Cape with the cross-hatched ochre thing, those were the first artists ever in the world who made the little holes in the blob of shells and strung them on, a, on, on some kind of a string and made a necklace and cross-hatched the ochre. The more recent, the 2,000, 3,000 year old cave paintings, I mean, who were these artists? I'm sorry that Zubeda is not here at the moment, but she once told me the story of um, a, a sand artist who she saw, oh, she's coming back. She saw she saw a record when she was hiking in the Drakensberg of a sand artist who, who, who was killed with his paints. Um, so what is this world of art? It's, it's like, it's, it's there, it exists, it informs all of, the, all of the South African artists, white as well, but it's not spoken. And so I suppose one of the things that we're trying to do through these art art sessions is to begin to talk and to begin to, to bring this stuff forward, which is, um, it's, it's so much part of our heritage. And as you know, we conclude these sessions, we say, with a quote from, from Baba Diom, the Senegalese environmentalist, and he says, we conserve what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we are taught. And the old ways of teaching, handing down from parent to child, are no longer as functional as they were. So we have to find ways of getting this, getting this knowledge to shape the paradigms of, of our curriculum, to shape our school textbooks, um, so that this knowledge, which is ours, which is our heritage as South Africans, can shape our society. Um, so, uh, but there were just a few other little points I'd like to make, if, you, if you'll indulge me, if I'm not speaking too long. Um, just um, one thing, I just want to share a lovely anecdote. When I, said, when I spoke to um, Ernest Mangloba and I said, oh, your family was in Fengu. And of course, you know, in the Eastern Cape, often, you know, um, 
why people know the Mfengu as Fingu and they say a tribe. And I'm so glad Ati explained that this is not a tribe. Um, but he said, Mfengu, you have to understand the root of that word. It's Dia Venguza, to be a refugee. So that was the old Ernest, the teacher from the school in, 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 in Limpopo speaking. And, and I'm really glad that Ati picked up on, up on that thread of the homelessness of, 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 the, of the family going back over generations. And there was one other point, if I may, Zipo Maya, or am I going on too long? Um, the other thing is that, um, well, two others really, but just to go back to this question of perspective, which Tembin Kozi raised, is that I, I feel that the particular thing about perspective and the particular thing about the vanishing point is that um, I came across this concept from a um, phenomenological psychologist that at the end of the vanishing point, it's possible to objectify the thing that you see at the end of the vanishing point. And that whole thing that happened with the European Renaissance and art was that you began to see people at the end of a vanishing point. You began to, the possibility of what the phenomenological, phenomenological psychologist called the despotic eye. Um, just think about that, the despotic eye, as it compared with an Ubuntu eye, starts to see people as objects at the end of the vanishing point. And that, you know, art, in fact, in a way, precedes philosophy. So it creates the philosoph philosophical framework for Europe to spread art around the rest of the world and see people as objects. And yes, the Cubists broke the form, but as Mangalba said, they didn't break, they didn't break through in terms of the spiritual content. And I believe that what Ernest Mangalba did was as significant for art in our times as that moment of the Renaissance and the vanishing point in perspective was for, for Europe in those times. And that is that he brought an image of the human ancestor and people in relation to the human ancestor to the, the pictorial plane on an equal footing, which exactly conforms with what um, Zabeda was saying about how he expressed himself to her. And then the, the last thing I'd just like to show appreciation of is that Tim Minkosi hinted at the fact that um, when Ernest said, the method in, in my method in work is almost Freudian and suggested that there's a set of values beyond the Freudian in terms of the subconscious. Well, of course, we have to go into African values to really understand that in its, in its wider, wider framework. Sorry for having been too long, but thank you everybody. And um, it's really nice to be here with you enjoying the film again. <laughs> All right, we don't seem to have any more hands, but I would like to, um, I'm wondering uh, if Alain uh, Spillman, would you like to, you know, say a few words before we close off today's session? Tim Gossi has not said anything. Yes, okay, with pleasure. I will come back to Tim. Oh, sorry. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes, we, we hear you. Okay. So uh, it's a uh, well, screen. But... Sorry. So uh, I was very, I am very pleased to to have seen that beautiful film done by by Bridget and Abdullah. It's a beautiful film, very emotional, and for me, uh, I'm so pleased because I have the feeling that. Ernest is just next door. He's just there, you know, and this is very beautiful. Uh, the different uh, opinions are also extremely interesting. I just would like to, to add two things. Uh, in 94, when Ernest came back home, uh, we, I, I, I flew with my family to to Johannesburg, and I joined the meeting, and uh, there was an audience very, very full of people, and I can't forget that word, which was said by I think McGovern, who was a friend of Ernest, saying to him, "Ernest, welcome home," and still today, I hear that musical voice welcome home was said it was so emotional so beautiful 
that this is important to say that Ernest was with Mark Wonga coming back home. And he was welcome with these two words, welcome home. I would also mention a, a second point with Ernest is he was always thinking to the man and all the discussion on perspective or not, but it was not, not really, how can I say, uh, so important for him. The, the most important thing was for him to have faith in the man, the man as a universal person. And through all his painting, and also uh, we can see, we can see uh, the, the, the drawing of a man, the affirmation, the affirmation being human, being a man, that's important. And this was expressed through different painting and all through his work. So well, these are the two things. And also I would like to, to thank you very much for, for you to, to, to make Ernest more known in the world. And this is important because he is very, he is not very well known and he has an important contribution to, to, to the humanity as he used to say. Well, this is what I would like Thank to Thank you say. so much, Alain. Uh, we will wrap up today's session. Uh, We've gone over um, our time, but I would like if there isn't anyone with last words, if maybe Tembi and Ati could maybe wrap up if they would like, just uh, to close off. Would you like to say anything? Uh, Starting with you, Tembi, and then at. I have not much to add, <laughs> except to say, you know, I mean, now when you sit there to focus on one thing, doesn't necessarily are not concerned, we are not uh, thinking of other things. But here's a point about the pre-exile uh, <clears throat> work, and it's true about uh, the discourse of art history. But also, I should not lose sight of the fact that it is those very historians who have managed to build the archives from which you are able to mine and read it. So without that archive, whether it's problematic or it's useful, I don't think most of what now we are learning about NS will be able to. So in other words, when we read these historians, we should not uh, arrive with what one call it uh, an opposition thinking. You know, I mean, one has to be always open-ended, but very critical as to what matters then. But also I want to add that, you know, I mean, my, my, my interest, uh, as, you, as you've noticed, uh, when I speak about line, Bridget, pick it up. When I speak about language, modes of thinking and producing the world, it's not necessarily, it means the line, which is a path. It means a line that is imagined and is also its own imaginaries and many other imaginaries. And it is that which uh, the artists leave behind more than anything. If those conversations are not recorded, it becomes difficult to get to what the artist was up to or his or her own invention. So that's why we need to pay attention to what the artist produces, you know what I mean? So that we can also understand what that, and also <clears throat> my interest in the creative language of my mother, it's, it's even himself, he says it, you know what I mean? Even when he, he, he talks without form, without language, there's no world of art. So in other words, Richard and Alien, by perspective, I'm not reductively thinking of the Renaissance vanishing point. I'm thinking about the world in which we're living in, whose perspective dominates the way we think, the way we do things, the vision through which we are forced to operate. It is that my number questions, to collapse that. And that was part of what he saw even from a distance from those conversations uh, with those artists in Cape Town, when he realized that, you know, I mean, that he knew that the world in which he operates, its perspective is not only narrow at the level of thinking, at the level of the regime, the way in which the society is, is constrained, oppressive regimes 
So it is that by perspective, I mean. <clears throat> so Art has opened it up. So I don't want to, 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 to repeat what he's saying. So what also I want to mention is that, of course, you know I mean, earlier on, you know I mean, Manoba is already engaged in thinking through language because before even he leaves, these captures have already evolved and they didn't need any justification to say, this work is not important, this work is important. But of course, now you move to a different context and I just as, as, a, as an important point. That's why at some point <clears throat> when we engage, for example, the popular uh, statue of um, the, the Madonna, I've opted not even to talk, you remember, <clears throat> if Bridget even went in Cape Town with IT, instead to perform the statue as a form of language, but that's what Manoba forces me to think about. You know, I mean? so when I'm performing that statue, whether I'm inviting a musician or I'm inviting a dancer, it is that I've been interested in how we think. So in other words, Artie, it's not only we are focusing on the, some of us uh, on the so-called European work, it's just the strategies in which we are invited or we invite ourselves to engage. You know, I mean? <clears throat> because uh, it's not only Bridget, the lines in the folds of the Madonna that you see, even in other sculptures, you'll find the line, the tracing of thoughts, the path through which we begin to think. So in other words, <clears throat> It is this that we need also to pay attention. I'm speaking now from both uh, being a historian and also anti-art historian, meaning that if Lefifi talks about a different sense as far as aesthetic is concerned, we need to pay attention to that and begin not only to explain it, but to theorize it and demonstrate its applicability first with his work and also with other artists' work. This is how discourse uh, operates. This is how practices develop so that the inquiry and the references are not always without what you call it, tangible sources. Because in most cases, black artists work, we don't have source from which to build on, you know. So, 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 so what I'm trying to say is that it is this that I was interested in just focusing as, as, as an exercise, you know what I mean? And, 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 and of course, it's an obvious argument <clears throat> that Everywhere, even today, it's not only pre uh, apartheid that black artists are always tutored, are always mentored, as if there's no exchange, you know, that take that, that take place between those the teacher and the student. For those who've taught so long, we know we learn so much. In fact, we planned our planned that from students' ideas, you know. So, so, and in in, in terms of race relations relations as well as uh, class relation, gender relation, and many other relations. What you get is that the black artist is always reduced to this so-called childhood that is always fed, is always given, is always, he takes as a consumer, is never a producer, is never a teacher, you know what I mean? And we know, you know what I mean, this weather, here and elsewhere, we, are, we, we leave homes with teaching, we leave, communities with teaching. We don't arrive at school bare hands. And some of us, in fact, teach ourselves and we teach our teachers. It's just that they have authority of de deciding whether to pass you or not. So in other words, how then do we begin to, to, to transform these forms? You know, I mean, they don't only operate at the, at the intellectual level. We need to develop systems so that we can contest as well as transgress them by putting things in place. And this, I think, is what uh, Ubuntu is, uh, and, and uh, Atta and Ubuntu is doing very well by putting things in place. So now, what else can students do? What other avenues could be explored? You know what I mean? That is going to be a process. Uh, as Ubedain have said, as Ubeda has said, you know, and one of the things, just as a last point, is that I've, I'm learning, especially quite lately in life, that we also spend time and we exhaust ourselves <laughs> responding to these writer historians whose work is flawed. Yeah. And by the time you realize, you know, when you haven't done the actual work of producing these new or different knowledges, mm. you know, so also you need to be mindful that you are not sidetracked, you know, into always uh, wasting time or spending more time trying to criticize and analyze them. You know, especially where spaces, they need new, they new, they need new ways of thinking. They need new things to, to work with. So this, that's just my, my, my comment. So in other words, I arrived in this conversation with that very kind of uh, clear, as I said, unlike I to give uh, two cents, I was interested to give 
a cent. In fact, I wanted to give a half a cent. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Uh, Ati, would you like to wrap up? Or, of course. Uh, of course. Sure. <laughs> no, you know, for anyone who knows the conversation between myself and Tim Gorsi would know that the conversation will always get a little bit um, interesting around these very difficult issues that we we'll, 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 we'll engage in. You know, I, I do think I, I have a, a little bone to pick with both the two main phrases that have been made. One being we've been, we must let go of the defensive mode. Or secondly, we must not assume that the white art historians, we, we must not be oppositional to the white art historians because nevertheless, we, we come from them as it were. Um, or we depend on them. And I, I, I do think that, I mean, if we move with Tim Goss's point that the, 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 the almost Freudian suggestion that Anas Magnoba, that Tim Goss himself develops um, as something beyond Freud is that most of the material that enable this opposition, this defensive perspective does not come from art history, comes from other things that have happened around it. And one of the interesting things about Eli Manoba is that you, one begins to see a world beyond art history, beyond the insular focus of disciplinary practice. That art historical focus, this enables us to see how artists like Anas Manoba, Anas Manoba speak from multiple disciplinary registers at the same time. In the sense that, that, that other perspectives, right? One of the things that Mangoba insists on the, in this kind of anti-perspective position, it is not necessarily that there is no perspective, but the fact that there's a multiple perspective. So, so the position that I want to advance is that the defense, the opposition, which Mangoba was part of and always insisted on, not necessarily through a binaristic logic, but well, I mean, it, I think the binaristic logic to some extent has to be retained, particularly against the not misrepresentation, but limited position in which we are, we are asked to speak of Ernest Mangoba. We have to in the face of all this uh, 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 problematic representation, articulation, argue for a defense of black African artists um, against the typical overwhelming hegemonic discourse of Western art history and, and, and African modes of, in which African artists are written about. So, in, in, with, with, without uh, speaking too much, um, I also want to say I'm very thankful for this platform. Uh, I think uh, maybe a second one should be engaged. A second possibility of this discussion should be engaged on this artist. I mean, we can't we can we can't just ignore. We just can't just fleetingly move on 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 NS in um, in other words thank you so much um, I appreciate the platform but just one last point <laughs> all right like you and I will speak all the time but the point I don't think I you know, I want to be uh, somewhat uh, not, not to correct but to, to, to clarify a point I'm not anti oppositional discourse what I'm saying, to be saying that we must thank the white I, I didn't say must thank. No, no, I didn't say must thank. I said, I the said perspective you give. I, no, 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 no. Let me correct you. I said, if it was not for the work that has been done, not to say thank you to the white, that's an archive that exists at a, at a, at a multiple level, whether it's in terms of the visuals we have at the level in which now we know, for example, that uh, 
It was this conversation Mangoba has across in dynamic spaces. You know, I mean, at the event, at the, at the time when, for example, Black didn't have resources to do this, this kind of, uh, do, what do you call it, documentary and preservation of information. But that's not true. That's not let true. Finish, let me finish. Let me finish. I didn't interrupt when you speak. Let right, me finish. Right. So what I'm saying is something you know very well I've done, and I've paid a great deal of taking these art historians. What I'm saying is, it is at times this hostile oppositionality that you will find these things are hidden, that they disappear from view because the, 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 the critical work we do, it forces everyone to, to shut down and to clear space. And that clearing of space, it clears also the resources at some point to a greater extent we need. This is not to beg, but all I'm saying is at some point, one needs a strategic way in which one thinks of retrieving those archives instead of killing the so-called white historian with that very archive. What now I'm also appealing is a different strategy in addition to what is in place. That is to say, how do we retrieve that archive? Yeah. That's, that's one point I want to make. The second one is that, you know, one thing I'm learning just to, as a point is, you know, in preparation uh, to, to, to this thing yesterday and the day after, I went to that Cape Town uh, 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 conversation at uh, the time of my noble. You know, one of the things I started to ask myself was, in particular, my uh, uh, interview with Cape Times, yes. with Thomas then. You know, I said to myself, when, uh, not when, what did Manoba say to, uh, to Emma? Because we never hear that. You know, and in, in most cases, it is this so-called patronizing relations that we hear, you know, which are a challenge we all know, like whether it's, it's Bunzaye or it's, it's Lipschitz, always helping Manoba. But very seldom we get what Manoba informed them, asked them to think about. Why I'm saying this, as I was thinking about that interview, because I've been doing also different work, you know, I mean, with, 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 with Emma, uh, Emma Stan since uh, the, the exhibition in 2019 of, of the Arabic uh, intervention. And then when I was there, I said, you know, I went to look at the dates to discover that in fact, before Emma went to travel across uh, Congo and Zanzibar, he has not met Manoba. He, he went after meeting Manoba. So hypothetical, I have to find a way of asking, was it also because of Manoba or other reasons that, other than the European reasons of, you know, traveling Africa, looking for the exotic and all of that, which is always emphasized about, about Emerson's engagement. What was Manoba's influence? If he was the what conversation they have? I'm saying this because even in the case of other artists like David Golan, especially with Bill Ainsley in terms of teaching, what you always hear, these artists are tutored, including Dumile, they are helped. But once then you begin to, to, to read, you know, it is quite right to read outside art history, which is why I was saying, equal I'm an art historian, I'm anti-art history itself. Once you read, it's where then you begin to open up history. In fact, you collapse it. You don't even care about it except whatever it offers. So before Bill Ainsley become this so-called praised uh, 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 savior of, uh, uh, in, in Colin Richards' notion of black messiah, if it was not for Selvin Vusi, Bill Ainsley would be, be something else about what Africa means. Because when he met Selvin Vusi in Peter Maritzburg, it is Selvin Vusi who begin to, pay, to, to, to force him to think differently about Africa. In other words, he taught him what Africa means and what Africa should become, you know. And these things be appeal earlier on. He mentioned in the interview over the time, these things are written out. So now it becomes as if he came out of appreciation of African art and more than itself in terms of African art. So in other words, these are the sources. So as a closure, one of the things I've been, I've been asking myself, what could be what one who called, you know, a, a, a way of biographical tracing of ideas, objects, thoughts, and seeing how they travel. And that will need a, a way of thinking methodologically. 
I'm not talking about academic methodological ways of thinking here. Yeah. Creative methodology, you can develop, you know, whether you're academic or not, and people have done that, you know. So what I'm saying is, once you start to process those, you trace like, uh, like uh, very well Art was doing with, hence I was saying, then you go, you start to say, yeah, in Cape Town, my mother spent time in District 6. How often do we hear that moment of District 6? What it is that Manoba not only made in terms of, for example, the, 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 what, what Elsa Miles praised, the, the faith, the statue, what other things, you know? So to what extent he also forced his wife to think differently, you know what I mean? So this is what I'm trying to think about without, so, <clears throat> without uh, 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 sounding, uh, what's the word? I'm not RT apologizing for these bloody white historians. Well, all of them in any way, they are racist. So all I'm saying is I want to think strategically of ways of how do you retrieve, you know, this but sometimes when you, when, you, when you think you arrive at discourse oppositionally, you can be clouded not to see other things because we are forced constantly. And for those who are, <coughs> who have an intellectual capacity like art, it's easier maybe to work with multiple regis, registers. But also you have to be careful as educators that you also open up you know, students and others, not to always to think with the force of opposition because they are going to miss a number of things. Yeah. So that's, that's, that, that would be my last uh, cent uh, in that. So in other words, thank you. And, and, and really, this was great. May, may I speak, Sifo? Um, uh, uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to 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 respond to Timmy just very briefly. I hadn't meant to do this, but just briefly. Um, one of the things when when Ashi so kindly acknowledged myself and Abdul Kader, you know, I have done this in many many forums, but I didn't do it today, and I'm sorry. I have to acknowledge how my thinking was informed and changed and shifted and expanded by Ernest Mangoba. I mean, he was such a profound teacher and continues to be until until today and so it, it, it's a kind of we hand on the baton um from you know to each other and um i think i wasn't the only person you know who who was impacted by him in that way when he came back to south africa in in 94 there were many others you know quite experienced artists i know who felt that their whole approach to African art was shifted as a result of, of Ernest Mangnoba. So it's, it, it, I really want to you know, um, stand humbly in front of that incredible learning experience. But I also wanted to ask Sipo if I could have the opportunity to speak just before she wraps up to profoundly thank Elaine for being here. I feel so touched and so moved to see you, to hear your voice and to be reminded by you of the essence of what Ernest Mangmobo was trying to say. I mean, I remember so well when he used to stamp, out, he'd stamp his fist on the table and he'd say, a man must meet man and that's it. And I, I saw a film about Giacometti, which beautifully expressed Giacometti's, in a sense, existential man. And when we're speaking man, we're speaking man, woman, you know, um, we're, not, we're not meaning man in the gender sense. Um, and I was thinking when I watched that film that Ernest Mangoba had a dialogue, had an artistic dialogue with Giacometti in which he said, this is the collective hum human, this is the collective man, woman, this is the, the Ubuntu man, woman in response to Giacometti's existential man. I don't know if you would agree with that, Alain. But also, I would also just like to um, pay a, a, a tribute to Alain's family, Alain's wife who passed um, and Elaine and Ernest and Sonia were very unusual in Paris in that they were both mixed race couples and, and had that um, experience of having to confront racism and all the misunderstandings and so on. And Elaine is a, a, a premier architect in Paris. Of, of, he designs beautiful bridges and he designed a beautiful um, COVID ward just at the beginning of lockdown to make it easier to treat people. And he has two wonderful children. And he was a, a, a friend, he and his wife and children were friends to Ernest and Sonia and, and also to Wonga when Wonga was ill. Wonga was ill for 
a year or so before he eventually passed. And Alain was an absolute stalwart. And so as, as your South African family, I'd just like to say how deeply important it is for us to have you here and to have your insights and perspectives. And we look forward to having more. The next, next week is about Ernest and the following week is also about Ernest. And we hope you'll be able to keep on coming and we hope um, we, we, we really appreciate continuing to have this contact with you. I feel so touched to see you today. Thank you, Alain. Uh, thank you, Bridget, and thank you to everybody. If you would like to revisit this uh, session, it will be up. There. It will be up on uh, Ata the Bundu Trust YouTube page in the next few days. Maybe let's do that till Friday, and then you can um, uh, revisit the session. But it will be without the film. So if you are a bona fide teacher or you are a community arts facilitator, or you know of one uh, who benefit from um, the workbooks that are created by Ajahn Ubuntu Trust and the films, please drop an email uh, at feedback at artubuntu.org or inbox on Facebook or Instagram uh, at artubuntutrust.org. No, social media doesn't have that. <laughs> So it's just at, at and Ubuntu Trust uh, on Instagram and on Facebook. Next week, as Bridget said, we are focusing again on, on Mangloba. Uh, next week, we are screening the very short five minutes film, Reading the Ancestor, and discussing it later. The following week, also, we will be focusing on uh, Miss Mangloba. So if you are able to join us, um, please do. And that's it for today. That's it for today. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our guest uh, speakers, Ati and Tim Kosikoniwe. And thank you, everyone, for joining in. Bye. And thanks to Zipo and to Malik. <laughs>